Greetings, stranger, and welcome to Ghastly Tales. You have stumbled upon an unusual, hidden, and foreboding underground vault, one filled with nightmarish visions. Here you will find stories to chill your bones, to stop your heart, and to terrify your very soul. Now, Pull up a chair and warm yourself by the fire. The rain is torrential outside, and I doubt you would get far in the dark. So you best stay for a while. Let us pass the time with a story, for I have such a strange and ominous tale to tell. Tonight's story is from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, who wrote many terrifying accounts of the macabre. And so now it's time to dim the lights, to sit by the flickering flame of the fire, and to listen once more to another ghastly tale. The Nightmare Room by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle The sitting room of the Masons was a very singular apartment. At one end it was furnished with considerable luxury. The deep sofas, the low, luxurious chairs, the voluptuous statuette, and the rich curtains hanging from deep and ornamental screens of metalwork made a fitting frame for the lovely woman who was the mistress of the establishment. Mason, a young but wealthy man of affairs, had clearly spared no pains and no expense to meet every want and every whim of his beautiful wife. It was natural that he should do so, for she had given up much for his sake. The most famous dancer in France the heroine of a dozen extraordinary romances. She had resigned her life of glittering pleasure in order to share the fate of the young American whose austere ways differed so widely from her own. In all that wealth could buy, he tried to make amends for what she had lost. Some might perhaps have thought it in better taste had he not proclaimed this fact, had he not even allowed it to be printed. But save for some personal peculiarities of the sort, his conduct was that of a husband who has never for an instant ceased to be a lover. Even the presence of spectators would not prevent the public exhibition of his overpowering affection. But the room was singular. At first it seemed familiar, and yet a longer acquaintance made one realise its sinister peculiarities. It was silent, very silent. No footfall could be heard upon those rich carpets and heavy rugs. A struggle, even the fall of a body, would make no sound. It was strangely colourless also, in a light which seemed always subdued. Nor was it all furnished in equal taste. One would have said that when the young banker had lavished thousands upon his boudoir, this inner jewel case for his precious possession, he had failed to count the cost and had suddenly been arrested by a threat to his own solvency. It was luxurious where it looked out upon the busy street below. At the farther side, it was bare, spartan, and reflected rather the taste of a most ascetic man than of a pleasure-loving woman. Perhaps that was why she only came there for a few hours, sometimes two, sometimes four, in the day. But while she was there, she lived intensely, and within this nightmare room, Lucille Mason was a very different 
and a more dangerous woman than elsewhere. Dangerous, that was the word. Who could doubt it who saw her delicate figure stretched upon the great bearskin which draped the sofa? She was leaning upon her right elbow, her delicate but determined chin resting upon her hand, while her eyes, large and languishing, adorable but inexorable, stared out in front of her with a fixed intensity which had in it something vaguely terrible. It was a lovely face, a child's face, and yet nature had placed there some subtle mark, some indefinable expression, which told that a devil lurked within. It had been noticed that dogs shrank from her, and that children screamed and ran from her caresses. There are instincts which are deeper than reason. Upon this particular afternoon, something had greatly moved her. A letter was in her hand, which she read and re-read with a tightening of those delicate little eyebrows and a grim setting of those delicious lips. Suddenly she started, and a shadow of fear softened the feline menace of her features. She raised herself upon her arm, and her eyes were fixed eagerly upon the door. She was listening intently, listening for something which she dreaded. For a moment, a smile of relief played over her expressive face. Then, with a look of horror, she stuffed her letter into her dress. She'd hardly done so before the door opened, and a young man came briskly into the room. It was Archie Mason, her husband, the man whom she had loved, the man for whom she had sacrificed her European fame, the man whom now she regarded as the one obstacle to a new and wonderful experience. The American was a man of about thirty, clean-shaven, athletic, dressed to perfection in a closely cut suit which outlined his perfect figure. He stood at the door with his arms folded, looking intently at his wife, with a face which might have been a handsome, sun-tinted mask, save for those vivid eyes. She still leaned upon her elbow, but her eyes were fixed on his. There was something terrible in the silent exchange. Each interrogated the other, and each conveyed the thought that the answer to their question was vital. He might have been asking, what have you done? She, in her turn, seemed to be saying, what do you know? Finally, he walked forward, sat down upon the bearskin beside her, and taking her delicate ear gently between his fingers, turned her face towards his. Lucille, he said, are you poisoning me? She sprang back from his touch with horror in her face and protests upon her lips. Too moved to speak, her surprise and her anger showed themselves rather in her darting hands and her convulsed features. She tried to rise, but his grasp tightened upon her wrist. Again, he asked a question, but this time it had deepened in its terrible significance. Lucille why are you poisoning me? You are mad, Archie, mad, she gasped. His answer froze her blood. With pale parted lips and blanched cheeks, she could only stare at him in helpless silence whilst he drew a small bottle from his pocket and held it before her eyes. It is from your jewel case, he cried. Twice she tried to speak and failed. At last the words came slowly, one by one, from her contorted lips. At least I never used it. Again, his hand sought his pocket. From it he drew a sheet of paper, which he unfolded and held before her. It is the certificate of Dr. Angus. It shows the presence of twelve grains of antimony. I have also the evidence of Duval, 
the chemist who sold it. Her face was terrible to look at. There was nothing to say. She could only lie with that fixed, hopeless stare like some fierce creature in a fatal trap. Well? he asked. There was no answer save a movement of desperation and appeal. Why? he said. I want to know why. As he spoke, his eye caught the edge of the letter which she had thrust into her bosom. In an instant he had snatched it. With a cry of despair she tried to regain it, but he held her off with one hand while his eyes raced over it. Campbell, he gasped. It is Campbell. She had found her courage again. There was nothing more to conceal. Her face set hard and firm. Her eyes were deadly as daggers. Yes, she said. It is Campbell. My God, Campbell of all men. He rose and walked swiftly about the room. Campbell, the grandest man that he had ever known, a man whose whole life had been one long record of self-denial, of courage, of every quality which marks the chosen man. And yet he, too, had fallen a victim to this siren and had been dragged down to such a level that he had betrayed, an intention if not an actual deed, the man whose hand he shook in friendship. It was incredible, and yet here was the passionate, pleading letter imploring his wife to fly and share the fate of a penniless man. Every word of the letter showed that Campbell had at least no thought of Mason's death, which would have removed all difficulties. That devilish solution was the outcome of the deep and wicked brain which brooded within that perfect habitation. Mason was a man in a million, a philosopher, a thinker, with a broad and tender sympathy for others. For an instant his soul had been submerged in his bitterness, he could for that brief period have slain both his wife and Campbell, and gone to his own death with the serene mind of a man who has done his plain duty. But already, as he paced the room, milder thoughts had begun to prevail. How could he blame Campbell? He knew the absolute witchery of this woman. It was not only her wonderful physical beauty. She had a unique power of seeming to take an interest in a man, in writhing into his inmost conscience, and penetrating those parts of his nature which were too sacred for the world, and in seeming to stimulate him towards ambition and even towards virtue. It was just there that the deadly cleverness of her net was shown. He remembered how it had been in his own case. She was free then or so he thought, and he had been able to marry her. But suppose she had not been free, suppose she had been married, and suppose she had taken possession of his soul in the same way, would he have stopped there? Would he have been able to draw off with his unfulfilled longings? He was bound to admit that, with all his New England strength, he could not have done so. Why, then, should he feel so bitter with his unfortunate friend who was in the same position. It was pity and sympathy which filled his mind as he thought of Campbell. And she? There she lay upon the sofa, a poor broken butterfly, her dreams dispersed, her plot detected, her future dark and perilous. Even for her, poisoner as she was, his heart relented. He knew something of her history. He knew her as a spoiled child from birth, untamed, unchecked, sweeping everything easily before her from her cleverness, her beauty and her charm. She had never known an obstacle, and now one had risen across her path, and she had madly and wickedly tried to remove it. But if she had wished to remove it, was not that in itself a sign that he had been found wanting, 
that he was not the man who could bring her peace of mind and contentment of heart. He was too stern and self-contained for that sunny, volatile nature. He was of the north and she of the south, drawn strongly together for a time by the law of opposites. They were not made for permanent union. He should have seen this. He should have understood it. It was on him that the responsibility for the situation lay. His heart softened towards her, as it would to a little child, who was in helpless trouble. For a time he had paced the room in silence, his lips compressed, his hands clenched till his nails had marked his palms. Now with a sudden movement, he sat beside her and took her cold and inert hand in his. One thought beat in his brain. Is it chivalry or is it weakness? The question sounded in his ears. It framed itself before his eyes. He could almost fancy that it materialised itself and that he saw it in letters which all the world could read. It had been a hard struggle, but he had conquered. You shall choose between us, dear, he said. If really you are sure, sure you understand, that Campbell could make you happy as a husband, I will not be the obstacle. A divorce, she gasped. His hand closed upon the bottle of poison. You can call it that, said he. A new strange light shone in her eyes as she looked at him. This was a man who had been unknown to her. The hard, practical American had vanished. In his place, she seemed to have a glimpse of a hero and a saint, a man who could rise to an inhuman height of unselfish virtue. Both her hands were round that which held the fatal file. Archie, she cried, you could forgive me even that? He smiled at her. You are only a little wayward, kiddie, after all. Her arms were outstretched to him when there was a tap at the door, and the maid entered in the strange silent fashion in which all things moved into that nightmare room. There was a card on the tree. She glanced at it. Captain Campbell, I, I will not see him. Mason sprang to his feet. On the contrary, he is most welcome. Show him up this instant. A few minutes later, a tall, sunburned young soldier had been ushered into the room. He came forward with a smile upon his pleasant features. But as the door closed behind him and the faces before him resumed their natural expressions, he paused irresolutely and glanced from one to the other. Well? he asked. Mason stepped forward and laid his hand upon his shoulder. I bear you no ill will, he said. Ill will? Yes, I know all, but I might have done the same myself had the position been reversed. Campbell stepped back and looked a question at the lady. She nodded and shrugged her graceful shoulders. Mason smiled. You need not fear that it is a trap for a confession. We have had a frank talk upon the matter. See, Jack, you were always a sportsman. Here's a bottle. Never mind how it came here. If one or other of us drink it, it would clear the situation. His manner was wild, almost delirious. Lucille, which shall it be? There had been a strange force at work in the nightmare room. A third man was there, though not one of the three who had stood in the crisis of their life's drama had time or thought for him. How long he had been there, how much he had heard, none could say. In the corner farthest from the little group, he lay crouched against the wall a sinister, snake-like figure, silent and scarcely moving save for a nervous twitching of his clenched right hand. 
he was concealed from view by a square case and by a dark cloth drawn cunningly above it, so as to screen his features. Intent, watching eagerly every new phase of the drama, the moment had almost come for his intervention. But the three thought little of that. Absorbed in the interplay of their own emotions, they had lost sight of a force stronger than themselves, a force which might at any moment dominate the scene. Are you game, Jack? asked Mason. The soldier nodded. No, for God's sake, no, cried the woman. Mason had uncorked the bottle and turning to the side table, he drew out a pack of cards. Cards and a bottle stood together. We can't put the responsibility on her, he said. Come, Jack, the best of three. The soldier approached the table. He fingered the fatal cards. The woman, leaning upon her hand, bent her face forward and stared with fascinated eyes. Then, and only then, the bolt fell. The stranger had risen, pale and grave. All three were suddenly aware of his presence. They faced him with eager inquiry in their eyes. He looked at them coldly, sadly, with something of the master in his bearing. How is it? they asked altogether. Rotten, he answered. Rotten! We'll take the whole reel once more tomorrow. A tale of misdirection there, from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Intense drama, caught in the throes of life, love, jealousy, and death only to be revealed as a film set, the parts played expertly by the actors, hints of the truth laced throughout the story, revealed with each subsequent reading. The blurred lines between reality and fiction fade as we ask the question, are we all just unwitting players on some darkened stage? with unseen forces torturing us in our very own nightmare room. I hope you enjoyed tonight's story, and please remember that you can listen to all of our audio content for free by downloading episodes of The Ghastly Tales Horror Show on iTunes and other podcast providers. Join us on Facebook at Ghastly Tales Present, and of course, you can stalk us on Twitter at ghastly underscore tales. For our original short horror films, narrations, and real horror documentaries, subscribe to Ghastly Tales on YouTube. Well, looks like the storm is about to pass. Time for us to part once more. But remember, the next time you feel enraged or hateful, look over your shoulder you may just be the victim of some unwanted direction. Unpleasant dreams, and join us next time for another ghastly tale.